I am so excited that Beth asked me to join her on this series called The Questions Jesus Asked. But before we get into the, uh, the question that I was given, uh, I want to just step back for a little bit. Let's, let's rethink some stuff here. By a show of hands, how many of you, when you were a kid in school, you loved taking tests? I, I, I see that hand. It's the geeky guy in uh, Sharonville. I hated it. I'd get that sweaty palms feeling, that nod in the stomach. I just didn't take tests well. And you know what the worst thing about tests are? The worst thing? The questions, of course. Uh, no questions, no tests. And here's the obvious. Why do teachers give tests with questions? It's to find out what we really know. Are we learning what they are trying to teach us? So let me throw out a little theory uh, to you here. It's, I think that all of life is a bit of a test. And guess who the teacher is? Right away, I know where some of you are going. If you're a church person, your little brain synapses are going to, uh, oh no, is this a pass fail thing? Is this about heaven or hell? I didn't study for this. I'm getting sweaty palms. Just relax, take a deep breath. Because I think this test is more about whether I'll let the kingdom of God uh, be expressed in and through my life or not. In other words, I'm, am I willing to let God um, use me to extend his, his expression of his grace, of his generosity, of his life to this uh, planet? So if teachers ask questions to find out what we really know, here's where this all gets squirrely. Why would God do that if he already knows what we think, right? I mean, if he, if he already knows what I know, then why question? So if God, if he already knows that I'm a, dipstick, then why test me to find out I'm a dipstick? Well, here's the deal. God doesn't ask questions to get information. God asks questions to lead us toward self-discovery because the, the things that are in my heart that, gets, that get exposed when God starts questioning, and he can do that by how I respond to uh, circumstances, to conviction, to whatever. The things that get expressed will raise the level of ownership on my part to do something about that. And that says something about how serious I am about following Jesus or not. If we're really honest, most of us would like God to just kind of wave a magic wand over us and say, selfishness be gone. And then we'd stop spending hours on Amazon or, or wave a magic wand and say, you know, gluttony be cast out and suddenly Doritos taste like Tide Pods, right? But that's not how real deep healing works. And Christians often carry that kind of magical thinking into their spirituality. And then they get mad at God when um, it doesn't happen and they stumble. For instance, if, um, if someone came to me and said, Dave, you are so self-centered, I probably would respond in a mature adult way and say, I know you are, but who am I? Right? Come on, let's get real. That's how most of us respond, except we do it in more sophisticated passive aggressive and angry adult ways, right? But suppose late one night, I'm wrestling with some uh, issue in my heart and I suddenly think, wow, I, I am really self-centered. Then suddenly I have a choice to do something about that. Now there's opportunity to change or not. There's a sense of ownership and a crucial opportunity to ask God to work with me and, and in me and, and to help me with this thing that I'm struggling with because now it's out in the light. In, in order for God to change us and use us, he has, to, he has to get us to understand two big things about ourselves. And, and, and this is what they are. This is, what are my motivations? You know, why do I do the things I do, whether good or bad? And secondly, what do I really value? What, what, what do I think is truly important? How do I even prioritize that? Those two things. And by the way, have you noticed that Jesus answered, always often answered a question with a question? How, you know, how annoying is that? For instance, after his resurrection, he's walking along the beach with his disciples. And all of a sudden he tells Peter how he's going to die. And it's not pretty. He's going to be martyred. And then he says to Peter, follow me. And that, just think how chilling that would be to know how your life is going to end. 
And then Peter, he looks over his shoulder and he sees John tagging along behind him. And he asks Jesus a question. It's, hey, what about him? What about this guy? And Jesus knows exactly what's going on here because Peter's playing a comparison game of sorts. It kind of goes like this. If I have to go through all this pain, I want everybody in the club to go through this with me. Misery loves company, right? I mean, you, you could relate to this, personalize this. Have you ever wondered why so-and-so, we all know a so-and-so, have you ever wondered why so-and-so never seems to have any like real problems, right? They, Come on, Lord, he's got a big house, he's got a great job, all his kids have straight teeth, and I'm driving a car from the last century. And that's what's going on here. So Peter is asking Jesus, why me? What, what, about, what about him? And Jesus looks at him and he answers, of course, with a question. And it's, what is that to you? He's like, how? You know, he, he's basically saying, this is just about you following me, and it stops there. So God is always digging into those two points with us. What's my motivation for doing what I do? And what do I really think uh, is important? And uh, for those of us who say, wow, you know, I, I don't think I've ever heard God speak to me like that. That's not true. I can guarantee that if you aren't wrestling with those two questions from time to time with relationships or in circumstances or at work or wherever, you're already dead. Um, God is speaking to us constantly about those two things. What are my motivations and what do I really value? And, and underneath that is the ultimate test, the, the cosmic SAT, that because those two questions will force us to answer the big bonus question point in our life. It is, will I follow Jesus no matter what? Because when I answer that question in the affirmative, as in, um, yes, Jesus, no matter what's going on, no matter how south my circumstances are, no matter how I feel, when I answer that in the affirmative, then he can really use me because it won't be based on what I think success should look like or not look like. I, I remember back in the day when my, I have two daughters and, uh, back in the day when they could not wait to drive a car and which excited me about as much as them going on their first date right to get their driver's license they had to take a uh, they had to take a written exam they had to complete over 20 hours in driver's ed school another eight hours uh, of in car spend 50 hours driving with a white knuckled parent and then take a driver's test then the state of ohio Trust them enough to let them get inside a two-ton hunk of metal to scare the you-know-what out of joggers and bicyclists on Butler Warren Road. Now think about this. Don't you think that God would want to test you first before he turns you loose in his name with his gifts and his power and what he wants to express? So with all that in mind, Let's look at this amazing story from Matthew's historical account of Jesus. The simplest question Jesus asks, here's a little spoiler alert here. The question that Jesus asks, which out of context doesn't seem that profound, is how many loaves of bread do you have? You know, what kind of deep metaphysical and theological question is that from, from your Messiah, right? My, my wife, uh, Anita and I, we have this, it's so dumb, we have this dumb running joke that we, I think we repeat it to each other about every time that we go into Kroger's. And we imagine ourselves walking up to one of the cashiers there and saying, hey, I'm new in town. Can you tell me where the bread is? And for some reason, that just strikes us as funny after the millionth time we've done that, you know, for all these years. But that question from Jesus almost sounds like that kind of question, right? So the story is in Matthew 15, and it begins with this. Uh, Jesus is on the side of this mountain uh, along the Sea of Galilee, and he's doing some just crazy supernatural uh, ministry. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people are getting healed of all sorts of diseases and physical issues and so forth for days. Thousands of people have gathered. Of course, you can imagine if that was going on, you'd be there. And people were amazed and worshiping God because of 
what was going on there. So finally, Jesus pulls his leadership team aside after doing this for several days, and he says, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry, or they may faint. They may collapse along the way. They're in the middle of nowhere in a, in a culture that walks everywhere. So his team responds with, I think, a very practical, logical, bean-counting answer. You know, they, 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 they say, where could we get enough bread in this remote place for a crowd this size? The, the disciples don't know it, but they just stepped into a pop quiz. The story doesn't say this, so uh, give me a little grace here. But I cannot help but imagine that Jesus kind of gets this kind of a sly, mischievous grin on his face as if he's thinking, I know something that you don't know, and it's going to blow your mind and force you to think differently about your heavenly father, about his power, his generosity, his compassion, and me. And with that, he does that irritating thing where he answers a question with a question. It's the kind of question that doesn't really help the problem as you think you understand the problem. And often, you know, the problem is not the problem. Often it's how you see the problem is the problem. So Jesus is about to cleanse the uh, lenses of their worldview glasses. And so he asks them this question, how many loaves do you have? Now, now it's, it's getting real. There's obviously more to the question because he just said that they had, you know, they, were, they didn't have anything to eat. And so the leadership team looks at each other. I'm sure they roll their eyes. And they say, mm, seven and a few small fish. And you already know what happens next. Jesus takes the bread and the fish and he gives grace and then he passes it to his leadership team to pass out. And all we know is that everybody ate 5,000 people, not counting kids and, and women there. And uh, everyone had more than enough. Plus they had enough to fill seven baskets of food that were left over. And by the way, that uh, the Greek word for baskets there is the same Greek word that's used for the basket that they that Paul climbed in and they they dropped him over a, over a wall to escape in a basket because people wanted to kill him in Jerusalem, right? That's the same word. These were not little Lagerberger picnic baskets. This was a spectacular transrational event. And suddenly we have a, a tangible expression of God's compassion and abundance that drives his generosity. Don't miss this. And the opportunity to play a part in it. The, the question was designed to create a choice in the psyches of the disciples. You know, the, the big cosmic bonus question, will you follow me with what you have? Or will you stay in prison in what you think you don't have? In other words, this is risky. You, you, you could look foolish here, but here's the deal. When you're with me, don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Because if you put what you do have in my hands, everything changes. Jesus, is what he's doing is throwing out this supernatural principle. Put what you do have in my hands and watch what can happen. Now, let me show you something. Can I, can I have the... Oh, look at this. This is a basketball, of course. I know very little about basketball. I, I enjoy watching games, probably how, like you non-musicians go to concerts, you jump up and down, you have fun, but you don't know if they're playing a B-flat augmented chord or a, they're playing in a 4-4 shuffle or anything, so don't judge me. But what I do know is that Steph Curry of Golden State is the highest paid NBA player, and in the time it took me to say that sentence, he just made 15 bucks. How's it doing for you per second, right? And by the way, he happens to be a very sold out Christian. But the point is this, this basketball in my hand is worth about 15 bucks at Walmart. And in Steph Curry's hands, it's worth over $40 million. And we're both Christians. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with him, I'm just saying. 
Same basketball, different outcomes. It depends whose hands it's in. And in the generous hands of God, everything is exponentially multiplied. I mean, the simplest moral of the story of the fish and loaves would be this. It's God saying, you give me what you have in your hands and watch how I can take care of you and the people around you. I just threw that out to the only three people that are in this room growing up. I didn't know anyone who had a healthy marriage. And so for our first seven years of marriage, we worked hard at it because, well, you know this, it basically takes three things. It takes good communication, it takes a lot of forgiveness, and it takes everyone's favorite, a dime to self. Who doesn't love that, right? I, and, and the truth is, I don't know how you do that without Jesus. And then we had our first baby. And once again, my fear of love scarcity popped up. What if I don't have enough love to pass around now? This is a family now. So, but when Rachel came, somehow more love flowed in and flowed out. And then a year and a half later, my fear when we were expecting again was, there are only, there's only so many slices of this love pie, right? And... and how will I do this long term? And once again, what was going on was I was operating with a scarcity mentality. And so when Katie came along, there was this outpouring of love that I just, I, I couldn't explain. And somehow I had missed what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 5, where he says, God has given us the, the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with love. Or as John, the Apostle John, who was actually part of that, a little leadership team at the Fish and Love story. He would later write, we love because he first loved us. There, there is no scarcity with God. There's, God is a, is a generous God in every way. And it's amazing when human beings catch this truth. For instance, there's this um, fascinating story in Genesis about abundance and scarcity and the way that we people think about it. And in those days, there was a, a rancher named Abraham, and he took his family and a nephew named Lot to settle in what is now Israel and the West Bank. And he really prospered there. They became uh, pretty wealthy. But Abraham and Lot's relatives began to uh, fight with each other, uh, other about uh, property and water rights and so on. The land just couldn't support them both. This could have been a time to argue about legalities or sue someone or, uh, you know, who's the patriarch here or whatever. But Abraham was growing in his trust in God's ability to provide. He had an abundance mentality. And that enables you to view all of life's problems, not with a zero-sum approach, but rather with a, with a win-win attitude. So Abraham calls Lot up and he says, this is not going to work. We, we should not be fighting within our families. For heaven's sakes, we're, we're relatives. So let's split up the land and you can have first choice. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Take a good look. Take the best. Choose whatever you want. And the story says that Lot, he looks around and he sees the Jordan Valley which is like a garden of Eden, and it's, it's well watered, it's fertile, it's green. And he jumps on that, and he chooses that. And for some of us, that would have been a problem if we were in business with one of our relatives. It would not have been like that. But because Abraham knew that God was well able to provide for him, he didn't approach it like there, hey, there are only so many slices of this pie, so I have to fight to get my slice and I, I want the biggest and best. Instead, Abraham seems to have an abundance mentality. And years later, he does quite well when he brings into the world a son that would begin the lineage of the savior of this planet. There, there, there is a simple way to grow that kind of thinking. And here's how. When my worldview has mostly me in the center of it, my spiritual wholeness, my, my peace gets out of whack. 
And one of the ways I can determine how much of my own life is in the center of my view is how I allocate my time, my emotions, my uh, thoughts, my resources, how much is focused on me. And surprise, surprise, I find that I can be a very selfish person left to my own devices. So I have to learn how to uh, think differently and to surrender more and more and more to Jesus and understand the connection between that and the abundant life that he talked about earlier. We used to have a very simple for a very simple definition for what a disciple is at the vineyard. It was a surrendered, transformed person who loves God and others. That's simple. Our job is to surrender. God's job is to transform us, and He turns us into people who deeply love Him and the people around us. It puts us on a, a, a developmental track, a continuum, a continuum to emotional and spiritual health because we're evolving from an inward focus to an outward focus. Let, let me give you a practical example. If uh, let's, say, let's say you like to work out and exercise. God bless you if you do. My motto is no pain, no pain. Um, if you're doing that, if you're working out, if you're exercising because you wanna be healthy to be around as long as you can to care for your family, it's just the best insurance policy you can have. If you just want to be around your family to care and love for them as long as you can, or you're doing it because you want to be a chick magnet, that's the difference between having an outward focus and an inward focus. Now, here's the real dilemma. If, if you have an inward focus, the most that you have in your reserves is what you do and have in your own strength what you're capable of producing yourself. That's it. And, and here's what I've noticed. People with an inward focus typically live, even if they have a lot, it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or under-resourced or whatever. People with an inward focus typically live with a scarcity mentality and never really experience the generosity of God in any uh, personal way and know him in the way that he wants us to know him. Let me um, close with a true story, as if pastors don't tell true stories from time to time. But I've told this story before, but I just love it so much. I, I've used it too much probably. But anyway, let me show you a picture of a guy. You know who this guy is? His name is Wesley James Autry. And some years ago, he was on a New York subway uh, platform in Harlem when a 20 year old college student had a seizure and began to convulse and fell down, the student fell down on the tracks of the subway as a train was coming in to the station. And Wesley was with his two little girls, they were aged four and six at this time, who uh, he was taking them to meet their mom because he was heading off to work then, uh, he was a construction worker. And he tr reached down and tried to pull in the pit, tried to pull this uh, college student back up on the platform, but he couldn't hold on to him. And there just wasn't any time left. And Wesley did the unthinkable. Right before the subway train hit this kid, he jumped down onto the tracks and grabbed this 20 year old in a bear hug, laid on top of him, flattened him out in between the rails of the subway train in a pool of dirty water as the train ran over them. To the horror of everyone who was standing on the platform watching this, and when the train finally came to a stop after car after car after car and going over him, the people there are yelling and screaming when they suddenly heard Leslie shout out, there are two little girls up there. Will someone tell them that their daddy is okay? <laughs> and the hat that Wesley was wearing was actually knit on the top by the train. It was that close, but they were both okay. And afterwards he got his kids home and went on to his job like it was a normal day. And no kidding, this is what he said. This guy needed help and someone had to do something. It's just an incredible story, but I found out a little bit more about this story recently. In an interview years later, just before he jumped on the tracks, 
Wesley felt like he heard a voice say, you can do this. He said he felt like he had been chosen to do it. And the interviewer asked him, well, as a religious person, did you ever think, well, why me? Why was I chosen? And Wesley hesitated. And then he said that, that right, before the, right before he jumped in front of the subway train, an incident flashed before his mind. 20 years earlier, about 20 years earlier, he had had a gun pulled in him. And when the guy pulled the trigger, the gun misfired and nothing happened. And up to that point, he wondered why he was spared. But on that day, on that subway platform, he said that he knew why. This was his moment. And he heard this voice say, you can do this. And he jumped. Well, what, what Wesley had in his hand on that day was, what he had was his life, his whole person. And that, in the hands of God, is the ultimate expression of God's generosity because it reflects his character of who he is. So let's stop. Uh, let's just stop there for a moment. And uh, if you would, just close your eyes wherever you are, you know, uh, wherever you are, unless you're driving. Close your eyes. Close your eyes just for a moment. And think about this. Are you viewing God with an abundance mentality or a scarcity one? What, what do you have in your hands that you can place into God's to see how he can show this planet his love, his, his generosity, his wholeness, his salvation? Whatever, whatever you have currently, maybe that just seems so small and, and insignificant to you, like, you know, like a few fish, or whether it's the, the ultimate gift, your, your whole life, your whole person. In the hands of God, it is exponentially multiplied, and it fills this broken, hungry, and convulsing world with grace and life. So, Father, I ask that you come in your power, in your, in your grace. I ask that you come in the, with the presence of your Holy Spirit, wherever we are spread out all over the city, the state, the country, the world, wherever you are. And, and I ask right now, God, that you would pour out your spirit and that each one of us would just take a moment to say, God, whatever I have, it's yours. I, I place it in your hands. Use it for your kingdom, for your glory, for your sake. And Father, I pray for any of us who have never really taken that first step of surrender. And I pray that we would that we would just cry out to you in our hearts, God, here, here's my life. It's yours. Take, take this brokenness, take these pieces, make it whole. Use me for your sake. Forgive me. Save me, God, save me and, and use me. Use me for your kingdom, for your glory. Save me, O oh God, my Father. Save me from all my sins. Save me from my own needs my own ends. Save me from selfish living. Save me from self-made plans. Save me for your own use, for your own hands. Save me, oh God. Please save me, oh God, from myself to be used by you who made me. Save me, oh God. Please save me, oh God. 
for my life has no reason to save me. Please save me. Sing again. Save me, oh God. Please save me, oh God, from myself to be used by you who made me. Save me, oh God. Please save me, oh God. For my life has no meaning till you save me. Till you save me. So, God bless you. Go be the church. Thanks for joining us for Vineyard Cincinnati Church, where for over 30 years, we have believed that small things done with great love will change the world. Vineyard Cincinnati is open to everyone, no matter what your thoughts are about God or church. Whether you're new to church or have been around it your whole life, you're in good company with those of us who are exploring who God is or rediscovering what the church can be. If you've enjoyed this service and want to know more about us, visit vineyardcincinnati.com forward slash connect and someone will be in touch with you very shortly. Again, that's vineyardcincinnati.com slash connect.